Australia is home to an adequately interesting array of mostly rather mediocre spiders, many of which have vastly more impressive and remarkable equivalents overseas. But overhyped as they are, I still hold a soft spot for this country's eight-legged ensemble, and have devoted a sizeable portion of my channel's content to sharing our Aussie spiders with the world, free from the ill-informed hysteria that so often accompanies them. I've had my fair share of close and personal encounters with many of Australia's most infamous spiders over the years, from gentle giants like huntsmen and golden orb weavers, to the overstuffed servings of centipede food sometimes known as funnel webs. But ever since I started this channel, there's been one very conspicuous absence on the roster, something that, quite frankly, no channel that prides itself on Aussie spider content can possibly go without featuring. It is perhaps the most iconic spider in the entire country, Latrodectus Hasselti, the Redback. Failure to feature this most famous of Australian arachnids, however, wasn't really a matter of choice. In the entire time I've lived in this country, I had only encountered Redbacks twice. The lack of Latrodectus was pointed out by several commenters on my recent tier list of Australian spiders, and I of course responded with the truthful, albeit unsatisfactory, excuse of never having a chance to film one. Well, it just so happens that, mere days after uploading the regrettably Redback Free spider tier list, I unexpectedly stumbled upon my third Latrodectus Hasseltine. And now it's time to finally do justice to this icon of the land down under. Though the Redback has done a great job eluding me, it's safe to say that many, if not most Aussies, wouldn't have anywhere near as hard of a time finding one. For Latrodectus Hasseltai is not only an extremely widespread species with a distribution spanning pretty much the entire continent, in certain parts of its range it can be very abundant. But the Redback wasn't always so ubiquitous across Australia. In fact, it was once suspected that the spider may have even originated elsewhere. At the time of the species' formal description in 1870, its range seemed to be concentrated around seaports, and the animal's apparent preference for man-made habitats paralleled the tendencies of known introduced species. But promising as these leads were, Evidence for the contrary later emerged, among them an earlier, informal description of the species from the Adelaide Hills, as well as established names in Aboriginal languages, both of which jointly suggest that Latrodectus Hasseltai was indeed an Australian native, and not an accidental stowaway brought hither by colonists. Even so, it seems that the Redback's current, widespread distribution was not always the case, and the species is thought to have originally been confined to southwestern Australia, with its subsequent spread across the continent aided in no small part by its incredible versatility, and perhaps above all, its ability to flourish amidst human habitation. Latrodectus Hasseltai, like many of its relatives, is highly synanthropic meaning it not only survives alongside humans, but derives significant benefit from such, to the point that the species can be considerably more prolific in developed areas than out in the bush. Though its presence now spans not only the entirety of Australia, but a multitude of overseas localities including New Zealand, Japan and India, the Redback's humble origins as a denizen of the deserts of the southwest may still subtly manifest notably in the apparent resilience of their newborn babies against dangerously high temperatures. Unlike the black-bodied adult females, juvenile Latrodectus Hasseltai are mostly white, and as I am sure we all learned in primary school science, black absorbs heat while white reflects it. This appears to have been inadvertently demonstrated during one recorded attempt to film these spiders under bright, warm studio lights. During this process, two adult females perished in the heat, while the pale-coloured babies remained active and seemingly unfazed. For a spider that hails from the Australian outback, 
This would, of course, be a valuable adaptation, for while adult females may conceal themselves within nooks and crannies, sheltered from the scorching rays of the sun, babies, soon after developing, have to disperse, and in doing so they must expose themselves to the full brunt of the elements, and their pale coloration may be a vital asset for this, enabling them to move about in these harsh conditions, with less effect from the punishingly high temperatures. Once the spider has eventually found somewhere to settle, it now has to turn its newfound shelter into a hunter's lair, a place where it can feed, grow, and to live out the rest of its life. And the way in which the spider sets up its home is deceptively simple. A latrodectus web is, at first glance, naught but a tangled mess, as haphazard and chaotic as my handwriting in the final moments of an exam. But there it is method to this madness, and order beneath the chaos. For the web of Latrodectus is in fact marvellously crafted and incredibly efficient, and a close look can reveal why. When it comes to spider webs, one is probably most likely to envision the quintessential orb web, a marvel of intricacy and delicate beauty as it shimmers in the light of the morning sun, stretching and swaying at the mercy of a cool, gentle breeze. These webs, built to ensnare flying insects, are largely two-dimensional. Latrodectus, however, takes an entirely different approach. Its web is not only broad, but deep, and it's tailored to ensnare prey not fluttering through the sky above, but crawling on the ground beneath it. The spider resides at the top, protected on all sides by a dense tangle of silk. Beneath the spider's living quarters are a series of individual filaments extending vertically downwards, stretched tightly between the spider's place of residence and the ground. It is these sticky threads that serve as the redback's principal means to entrap prey. Small prey items, like ants, can be captured by these strands without any direct action from the spider itself. Their anchorage to the ground is rather weak, and a struggling prey item can easily dislodge them, causing the stretched filament to contract, hoisting the unfortunate victim off the ground where it remains, suspended helplessly in mid-air, completely at the mercy of the resident spider. But redbacks often ensnare larger, heavier prey items too. Isopods are commonly caught in their webs and they have even been known to entrap small vertebrates like lizards and snakes. Such animals are obviously far too heavy to be lifted off the ground by a single contracting thread, so to capture these, the spider has to get involved itself, using its rear legs to fling silk over the target, until it's sufficiently restrained for the spider to safely approach close enough to deliver a killing bite. Latrodectus may seem virtually unassailable in their webs, but a few creatures are nevertheless capable of preying on them. Among the most surprising, perhaps, are the falsives. These spindly, long-legged spiders are remarkably proficient hunters, and the very features that make them seem so vanishingly delicate are in fact key to their success. Their incredibly long legs allow them to wrap their opponents in silk, while holding their tiny body off at a safe distance, rendering them capable of subduing potentially dangerous adversaries like redbacks with little risk of retribution. The genus Latrodectus are collectively known as widow spiders due to the prevalence of sexual cannibalism among many species, in which the female may consume the smaller male during or immediately after the mating process. And Latrodectus hasseltine not only exhibits this behaviour, but takes it to an entirely different level. Male redback spiders are not only consumed by their mate, but quite often appear to virtually offer themselves up on a silver platter. During copulation, the male somersaults so that his abdomen comes to rest in contact with the female's mouthparts, thus inciting her feeding response. In an added twist to an already rather fucked up love life, male Latrodectus hasseltai have also been recorded mating with immature females approaching their final molt, piercing the soon-to-be-shed outer exoskeleton to access the newly developed reproductive organs beneath. 
end, unlike attempts to mate with adult females. Copulation with penultimate females rarely ends in cannibalism, allowing males to mate with multiple partners. This behaviour does appear to be quite prevalent, with one study finding that roughly a third of immature females collected in nature had already mated. In other words, a redback's dating options seem to be split between cannibalism and underage hookups. Can't say I'm particularly envious of the male spider's two choices, but they've doubtless served the species well, so who am I to judge? And on that excessively weird note, it's time to wrap things up. If you understandably wanted me to touch on the redback's medical significance, well, sorry to disappoint, but I figured that's a topic that's best left for its own specially devoted video somewhere further down the line. Plus, there is no shortage of content on YouTube about how venomous Latrodectus are, so I decided to centre this video around the other 99% of a redback's life. If you're interested in seeing the spider tier list that I referenced earlier in the video, then you can check that out here. And if you enjoy my content, you are of course welcome to subscribe. Thank you all for watching, and I shall see you again next time.